the design of the network is the result of the requirements based on those use cases. So the use cases that we talked about before, so mobile broadband, low latency, those things, if we have a deep understanding of what is required by those use cases, then that implies some form of network architecture or network functions and features that need to be included. So they will include things like 5G and LTE interworking. So dual connectivity, I suppose, is one way of referring to that. So those option threes, option fours, option sevens that we will come back to, it's kind of all about dual connectivity uh, in the network. But that also leads to that nice graceful architecture where you can, you can evolve towards a fully standalone network without necessarily pressurizing the population of mobile devices to upgrade uh, immediately. We would, of course, like to interwork with so-called non-3GPP access as well. We always say non-3GPP, but really what we mean by that is, for the most part, Wi-Fi, but it doesn't matter what it is. It, it could be Bluetooth, it could be some sort of you know, IoT protocol, uh, but the 5G network architecture, like the 4G before it, and to a certain extent, the 3G before that, uh, we always have the means to allow some degree of interworking. I would maybe suggest in the 5G network version of this, though, the non-3GPP access, there is a tighter or deeper interworking between something like Wi-Fi and the core network. We will in the next section talk a lot about the new architecture of the G node B. We have opportunities now either to fully distribute the G node Bs or you know, where the occasion calls for it, but we can centralize many of those uh, functions. So centralized G node B may otherwise be known as base station in the cloud. So what you think is the base station could effectively be uh, sitting in a data center somewhere. So there are all kinds of weird, and wonderful, um, creative architectures that we'll address later on. But one of the things that drops out of the use cases as well is the requirement for low latency communication services. Now it depends what that service is, you know, whether it's collision avoidance or some, you know, AR, VR entertainment service. Uh, but one of the arguments in discussing architecture leads to the, the inclusion of multi-access edge compute, uh, otherwise known as MEC. So basically putting a data center at the base station in order that we're able to distribute the content or distribute the processing required to address a specific service. Because if I have some sort of fancy collision avoidance driver aid on my vehicle, does my vehicle have to send that information to a, a data center on the other side of the world to compute or to calculate whether there will be a collision or not and then send the data all the way back? I mean, that of course then flies in the face of what you would otherwise want to be a low latency service. The closer I can bring the computation in support of that low latency service, the closer I can bring that computation to the actual end user itself. It does rather sort of point in the direction of having a base station equipment that has direct access to data center capability, which is a bit of a weird one, but we're gonna, we are gonna look at some architecture options because multi-access edge compute and this idea of centralized and or distributed G node Bs lends itself quite nicely to an early breakout uh, of the network. You don't necessarily have to go through the traditional core network to get to the computing point that you require. We could be included as part of the access. And of course, when you want to do all of these things and do them efficiently, then you need NFV, Network Function Virtualization, and that would be augmented with software-defined networking. So NFV and SDN are not new ideas by any means, you will find definitions of these coming out of the standards body called ETSI, the um, European Telecommunication Standards, in standards Institute. Uh, so that's been adopted by 3GPP for inclusion as part of the 5G network architecture. Yet yeah, not, not a new idea in any sense. People who have worked in IT for decades kind of look at this stuff and go, well, it's nothing new here really. But to a telecoms infrastructure, and certainly to a mobile telecoms infrastructure, the idea of a sort of fully dynamic virtualized network and one which indeed is defined by software is new okay we've never done this before in our networks you, you may have data centers and you may be running virtualization layers within your network and you might have a, a vims a virtualized ims or your billing system might have been implemented in some virtual environment but it's not the same nfv sdn that is required for a proper 5g network so there are different scales of NFVSDN, if you like, and we're not quite there yet with our current network infrastructures in terms of a fully virtualized network. These two things lend themselves, of course, to the idea of network slicing. Kind of hard to do network slicing without the idea of a software-based network. 
a limitation perhaps of LTE was that it was effectively an IP-based network. So IP would come in at one end, it would be routed through the network via IP, and it would pop out at the other end of the network. But there was just a large assumption that across the 4G network, that you know the kind of traffic that you would want to be moving is would be IPv4 or IPv6 based. Um, now the 5G network makes no such assumption, and whilst indeed you can do IPv4 and perhaps v6 as well, we also support the transport of Ethernet, so effectively a layer two uh, process, uh, or maybe just some unstructured, you know, where we don't know what it is. It could be some sort of weird proprietary IoT protocol. Um, doesn't use IP or doesn't use Ethernet. So we support um, multiple uh, data structures that can be passed across the network as well.